Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to hear our, our next spotlight speaker. Uh, I think we're going to end this uh, session with a happy face as well. Um, Yolanda Perdomo is uh, the director of the World Tourism Organization, uh, the UNW. Uh, UNWTO, uh, and she brings a really interesting perspective. A lot of us have been talking really broadly about trends, but she has data, she has forecasts, so she knows where people are going, and she has a really uh, smart bit of analysis. I wanted to start by just uh, briefly uh, describing who we are, because I know many of you are not very familiar with the World Tourism Organization. Uh, this is uh, the UN agency in charge of promoting responsible, accessible, and sustainable tourism. So that tourism really becomes a tool for development, so that it can really make a difference. And we try to do with all our members uh, to put together projects so that we minimize any negative uh, side effects of tourism and maximize uh, the positive ones. We are like UNESCO, FAO, and this is the whole uh, UN system. And um, we uh, interact with most of, uh, any, uh, of other UN agencies that you are probably familiar with. This is the Global Code of Ethics for Tourism is our reference. Uh, and I particularly like Article 2.1. Uh, that tourism, when practiced with a sufficiently open mind, it is an irreplaceable factor of self-education, mutual tolerance, and for learning about the legit legitimate differences between peoples and, cult and cultures and their diversity. I think if there is a, a point of in time where this is important, it is right now. And uh, it is also uh, not only uh, tourism can make a difference, and it's especially important nowadays, it is also a very important sector. As you see here, it represents 10% of uh, uh, GDP internationally. It's, it's one out, out of 11 jobs. It represents 1.5 trillion US dollars in exports, 6% of world's exports, and 30% of services exports. So, I mean, not very many people sometimes are familiar uh, with these figures. And it has uh, really showed very positive numbers in the last years. Uh, these are the results of 2015. Uh, as you see, there uh, has been an increase of 4.6% in terms of international tourist arrivals. Uh, in 2012, we had a landmark. Uh, we saw a one, a billion, uh, uh, one million tourists uh, crossing borders in a single year. And this is increasing year uh, after year. It also, um, in 2015, we saw an increase of 4.4% in international tourism receipts, and also uh, huge numbers in terms of international passenger uh, transport. And uh, now in 2016, we see almost the same figure, an increase of 4.4% in the first half of 2016. Uh, if we are looking at the ranking of I mean, the countries that receive the uh, uh, biggest number of uh, uh, tourists, uh, it is headed by France, followed by United States. In the third position is Spain, the fourth position is for China, and then Italy. And that has changed a lot in the last, uh, in the last uh, 50 years. Um, in, in terms of the projection for 2016, well, now it's, it's, uh, we are ending this year, we see I mean, what we forecast is uh, an increase uh, at the end of the year uh, in between 3.5 and 4.5%. And the regions in the world that are heading this uh, are uh, Asia and the Pacific and the Americas. And now I, uh, I want to show you something that I think is extremely relevant. We have this publication, Tourism Towards 2030, and here uh, we try to, uh, we say, quantitative analysis, and this is the projection we make for uh, um, until 2030. I mean, I don't know many sectors that show these figures. 
As I told you before, in 2012, we had that landmark. And uh, in, by 2030, we expect to have 1.8 billion uh, visitors uh, crossing borders in a single uh, year. And that, uh, that represents mm, uh, roughly 43 million new tourists every year. So th the opportunities are huge. Now, uh, this is an opportunity for those destinations that do things right. And uh, I mean, what we also forecast is that the, um, the uh, purpose of visit is not going to change that much. It's going to be mainly leisure, recreation, and holidays. And when we see uh, what is going to change, well, right now it is um, um, Europe that has the, the 51% of that share. But by 2030, this is going to change a lot. And it's Asia and the Pacific, the region that is going to grow the most. So this is also a huge opportunity. In terms of uh, outbound markets, it is China who's leading that ranking. And then it's followed by United States, Germany, United Kingdom, and France. And now I'm, I want to talk a little bit of our perspective about luxury travel. Uh, in 2012, we launched uh, um, our city tourism uh, activities. We did that together with 22 cities in the world, and uh, we, they signed what we call the Istanbul Declaration because the first city tourism, uh, the global conference on city tourism, the first one took place in Istanbul that year. And we started to work on what was important and relevant for those cities. We have had a number of activities because of that declaration. And one of those was a prototype, a pilot project, because we, we carry out prototypes to do a learning process with our members so that we can offer the right answers to our member states. We have 162 member states and 500 affiliate members all over the world. And they need to know what's going on. And we cannot just talk about theory. We do a lot of research. But sometimes we have to apply that knowledge together with our members and see what happens so that they have a methodology afterwards to do product development and those kind of things. So one, the one we did first did is called Precious Time, and it took place in Madrid. And it was to do product development for the premium segment in cities. Um, Madrid wasn't positioned, it's not positioned right now as a premium destination, and we were wondering why and what it could be done to change that. And when we did this study to, 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 to carry out that exercise, we did a qualitative analysis in uh, some of the outbound markets that were uh, strategic for Madrid, Mexico, USA, Europe, um, several countries in Europe, Latin America, Russia, Asia, and China. And the first thing we saw is that the perception of luxury was completely different uh, in, in the US in comparison to Russia, for example. And then we also discovered something else. Uh, Obviously, something to be premium has to uh, be based in personalization and exclusivity. It has to be a tailor-made uh, experience, but we also discovered that it has to have three main elements. A learning exercise, and that was something new for us. People expect to learn something when they go somewhere, when this is a premium uh, 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 experience. They have to then, of course, to have enjoyment and, and differentiation. But the learning component was new. And therefore, uh, we designed a set of experiences in Madrid uh, together with museums, shops, restaurants, um, a, a, a bunch of different activities with local artisans to do that. To, to be able to, to have some innovative products for those customers who are really looking for something new. And it was, we also, I mean, it's obvious, and it has been said here so many times, it had to be authentic. And the problem was that to look for the right elements was difficult, because normally it's little artisans that do something special. Then many of those stakeholders who, who had to work together are not used to do that. So there was a challenge here in terms of governance. Who's going to lead that exercise? With which rules? How are you going to ask them to 
act actually afterwards commercialize those new products together because that has never been done. That was traditionally done by the tour operators. But now the model has changed and nobody's really leading this process. Some hotels are doing it, some companies are doing that, but when you want to reposition a destination and to offer something new, you have to work with the rest of the people there. And that's difficult to do. So uh, we obviously had that, that was a challenge. And then we said, well, if it has to be authentic, what can we look for? So that really, because I mean, for us at that moment, uh, if you want to buy an, an Hermes bag or a Louis Vuitton bag or a watch, uh, you can go anywhere. You can go to Via de la Espiga, you can go to Faubourg Saint Honoré. Why are you gonna go to Madrid, to Calle Serrano to do so? We had to offer something else and maybe afterwards they are gonna buy those products too. So we started to think about it and we also discovered something else because we, every two years we do a, I mean, a survey uh, with, to, uh, with our members. We send a survey to our member states and we asked them about their priorities. And two years ago, we found out something that was completely new. We saw that. Their priority was culture. We have never, we have never seen that before. And when we asked the same question to our affiliate members, you know, those um, private companies, universities, all those um, uh, really entities that are also our members, the, the main concern was public-private collaboration for obvious reasons. But the second, again, was culture. And we are convinced is th that it's because they, they know perfectly well that to design those new products and services and to be authentic and to be able to differentiate themselves in comparison to other destinations so that they offer value and they don't have to, co to compete in terms of price, you have to look, I mean, you have to look at heritage, tangible and intangible heritage because that's what makes you unique. And when you do that exercise, the first thing that comes up is gastronomy. It's what makes you unique and different, and it's what makes us happy uh, when we visit the destination. So, so we started to work in that segment, and we created the UNWTO Gastronomy Network that is composed by both member states and affiliate members. So it's a transparent framework where we can do a practical exercise of public-private collaboration and to learn how this can be done. And gastronomy is key. And, and yesterday, uh, I think you raised the question, yeah, I mean, we're talking about some an experience, but how do, you, do we do that? How do we make it immersive, something completely different? Well, gastronomy is, that's it, for five reasons. Because it allows your destination to be different or your, your, your business to be different. You, you can have a unique selling proposition through gastronomy. You can address a new traveler profile. In many mature destinations like Spain, uh, many places are looking for another type of customer that is able to and willing to spend more money uh, that probably has been everywhere. And to do that, you need to really provide something completely different. And gastronomy is one of the ways uh, to do it. And it has been clearly uh, explained in the, in, the, in the panel before. Uh, that's something very strategic and very important too. You can bring tourists to places that otherwise they would never visit. And I will explain, I will use an example later on. Uh, you can really build a very nice narrative through food. And if it, because if it, it has to be emotionally, and if, if you don't use an element like that, or something that is connected to heritage, it's very difficult to do so, and to have a, a, a communication strategy that is effective. And then, of course, you can have the loyalty of the visitor a, a lot uh, easier and have a strategy also for that. So we kept on thinking, and uh, I'm including this example because it was also mentioned yesterday. You, you talked a lot about wine tourism and that this is really getting uh, important uh, for uh, the tourists in, in, in Asia. We, uh, there, there's the, the leading brand, brands of Spain forum. It's like the most important brands of Spain. They decided to become an affiliate member of the, of the World Tourism Organization to do this exercise with us. They wanted us to do a prototype 
a product development, a development exercise on wine tourism. And we did that with five of the main wineries in Spain. Uh, Osborne, González Vías, Freixenet, Pagos del Rey, and Barbadillo. They are big groups that have wineries all over Spain. And um, we came up with this uh, brand, The Joyful Journey, and that is going to be applied in Spain with this label, Spain through its wineries. And the, 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 the interesting uh, exercise here is that it, is, it went uh, much further than a wine tourism experience itself. What we saw is that by doing that, by using wineries as a way to explain the resources around in that territory, we could show another perspective from Spain and really be able to attract a new and different type of customer who's, who really wants to learn about the place, who wants to be part of it, who wants to learn and to have something that is really special. So what we came up with is with experiences that allow you to visit Spain, to, to go to places that you would never visit, and to do it only having a look at what is directly or indirectly connected to every winery. For example, in the south of Spain, the, um, some of the wineries have 200 years. It's the case of Osborne or González Vías. They are beautiful places, and the connections with the territory are incredible in terms of culture, history, art, everything is linked. So we decided we would show only that part of Spain, the only the, the, the part of Spain that is only linked to the wineries and to the history of those wineries. And it was very interesting. We um, organized our first conference on wine tourism this year in Georgia, in the Caucasus, and uh, we invited Mike Beseth uh, from the Wine Economist. And when we did the, 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 the study to do this prototype, he said something that we found very interesting. He said, people are complicated, so the wine tourism experience must be complicated too, if it is to be meaningful, memorable, and profitable. And I think this can be applied to any premium experience, to anything that is connected to travel, uh, to, to luxury travel. So we started to work with those wineries. We did a work field all over Spain, and we thought it was nice. Uh, the idea of the um, resveratrol that is present in the red wine that is supposed you to keep you, uh, supposed, uh, supposed to keep you younger, and it's used also for cosmetic uh, purposes in France, uh, for example. And uh, we thought that it would be extremely nice to design a tourism, new tourism experience that would uh, allow you to have more time or to feel that you have more time. And I think yesterday was also mentioned that time is a form of luxury that makes you happier, also for obvious reasons. We're talking about wine. And that makes you younger because of that effect. And we asked those wineries to design together this new product that had to have those three elements. And we then added another uh, uh, component to make it more sophisticated they have to have some sort of, uh, they have to be connected to uh, the three types of wines that exist in Spain. Uh, and they are, uh, and therefore the three elements are generosity, effervescence, and tranquility. So this is, this is I'm sorry because it's in Spanish, but this is what we did in the, in the, in the, um, in the workshops when we work with them. We connect uh, heritage, history, and uh, activities uh, in the open air to having more time. Uh, we connected gastronomy, music, and everything dealing with art and so on with being happier. And we connected sports, spa, you know, wellness, yoga activities, and well-being with keeping younger. So everything that was designed was in, any, in, in some of these three axes or in, in the three of them at the same time. And then they have to add those three other elements I mentioned before. So uh, we had a very sophisticated way and to, to, to do product development. And you know, in Spain, it's not part of our culture to, do, to work in teams. It's part of the way we are. Uh, that's, I think, a lot more Anglo-Saxon. But we saw when we did that exercise with the wineries that they really did that. They uh, understood that the only way they could do that is working together. If not, it's impossible to position Spain as a wine destination. It's not in the ranking. It is in the, in, the, in the first five in terms of wine production and so on, but not in wine tourism, which is a paradox, and it shouldn't be that way. 
And they understood they had to work together. And they, they had to work together also, not only alone, but with restaurants around the wineries, with little hotels, with all the um, providers of something that could be interesting for the tourists. And that was extreme, I mean, that was new. Because right now, the only visitors they are getting come from Spain. It's do domestic tourism, but they don't spend the night there. So when you want to attract another type of customer to spend there five, six, seven days, you need to do that exercise with all uh, the offering uh, that surrounds uh, the, uh, the area. So this is what we did, and this was presented in our first global conference on wine tourism in, in Georgia in September. We are also now organizing a World Forum every year. It, it takes place in Spain every two years. We do it with the Basque Culinary Center. And, uh, and in between, we organize it in other places of the world. This year took place in Peru. Next year, it's going to go back to San Sebastian. And the year after, it's going to take place in Thailand. And this is what we're going to be discussing. We also, when we did that um, Madrid Precious Time prototype, we discovered also the power of the shopping tourism. That was something we have never really uh, 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 took into consideration when we are talking about tourism. We launched a global report on shopping tourism because of that, and we created a shopping tourism uh, network. And in these prototypes, as I said before, what we do is product development, branding, the communication strategy, the commercialization, and the governance model. And I'm mentioning this because of what I said before. Right now, the main challenge, when we want to be innovative and to create something new in tourism, nobody can do it alone. It's impossible, not even the best hotel, because it will be like a piece of quality in something that doesn't really help when they, they, they want to commercialize that experience. And we have seen that every destination has the same problem. And when they want to do so, they have problems in terms of legitimacy. Uh, when they talk to the private sector, sometimes they are reluctant because they don't want to work together because sometimes they are competitors or in small places because they just don't like each other. In other places, you have a different political color at local, regional, and national level, and that makes it even more difficult. So uh, when we step in, people accept to do so because we don't have any commercial purpose and we don't have any political color and the only thing we want to do is to learn to help our members. So the governance model there is key and you have to have clear rules and you have to have a, the right framework for that to happen and this is difficult to achieve. We have done several exercises. We did one for example in Punta del Este in Uruguay to, to fight against seasonality and uh, we are going to do another one in Mendoza in Argentina next year. And it happens everywhere. So this is something new that we are going to be facing. It's like we are going to, I mean, we are going to need to work as a team in a way that we have never had to do it before. And uh, that's why public-private partnerships, partnerships are so important. And you have to have uh, an approach, a methodology to do so. I want to end, I'm sorry because I think uh, time's up with uh, something that I wanted to convey to you. Um, next year, uh, 2017, is going to be the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. Uh, this was agreed in 2015, and it has happened in the last 40 years only like twice that tourism is in the agenda, that is the topic of the UN for the year, so it's, it's a great opportunity. This is connected to the uh, SDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're going to launch a campaign that is, uh, this is the hashtag, travel, enjoy, respect. What we're going to try to do is to convince people that every small detail you do when you travel, all those million people, I mean, the one billion people, more than one billion people that travel uh, uh, every year, if every single person uh, does something positive when they go to a destination, that can really be a big difference. It can mean a big difference. And it's, we, when we, we are now the, uh, uh, designing the whole campaign, I mean, we're going to have people traveling all over the world. Um, the, I mean, there's going to be a lot of celebrations, in, 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 starting in Fitur with the king and uh, ending in Geneva in the UN at the end of the year. But um, what is important for us 
is that uh, really um, people understand that they can join this movement, that everybody can. And you can also, by using this hashtag, and joining the campaign. That's extremely important. And uh, when we are, I mean, we're now thinking, as I said, of what we're going to do, but we're trying to think about something like warriors of good or something. Like, it's like with so many negative things happening right now, really a lot of people want to make the difference. That's very m millennial, and that's pretty much in line with what it has been uh, said here. And this is what I wanted to end with. This is the, a message from uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon till the end of the year now. You know that we're going to have a new Secretary General from January onwards. And what he says is, the potential of tourism for sustainable development is considerable. As one of the world's leading employment, employment sectors, tourism provides important livelihood opportunities, helping to alleviate poverty and drive inclusive development. So I want to think, I would like to think, that you know, if we are able to design the perfect experience that has, you know, that is authentic, that has those elements that I mentioned before, that where there is a learning uh, process, well, if we can add also that that every single tourist can also make a difference and can do something positive when they go to a destination, that really can change things a lot. And I think that could be actually the ultimate form of luxury. Thank you so much. The main question I had is that this seems really challenging to work with, you know, a lot of different people, um, and and I was wondering how you interact with the, the the national tourism organizations, and also how you get everyone on board with your priorities. That seems like it must be pretty complicated. Um, it, we we can do any of those exercises with any member. It can be mm -hmm. a member state or it can be an oh. affiliate member. Therefore, okay. if, for example, in Spain it was an affiliate member, it was the leading brands of Spain Forum who asked for it, and we did it with the private sector with those five wineries. But when we do an exercise like that in the country, we have to have, I mean, the, the, the member state has to agree with that, obviously. And uh, they decide who they bring in. We just say, well, we need a number of hotels, a number of restaurants. We need people who organize activities uh, related to um, culture, art, sports, and so on. We don't use, I mean, we don't do it with very many. If not, we never, we would never end. It normally takes like eight or nine months to do a prototype. And then it happens naturally. It's challenging. But we have an approach now that make, allows uh, uh, to do so. So it really is really, it's really going well. And the first exercise we're going to do is in Argentina, and that was a request of the ministry. So they, they are the ones who are promoting the idea, and then again they will choose with whom we are going to work. Thanks a lot for your Thank time. Thank you so much. <laughs>